Hi, I'm Jamie Batts, your instructor for AMP2. We're going to wrap up this chapter on metabolism and energetics. And we were just talking about having a balanced diet, which is always important. And I urge you, if you have never done any diet tracking before, do it, right? Uh, use one of those like fitness apps, like my fitness pal or um, my big fat secrets, one of them, or um, even just getting um, one of those fitness trackers, like the little wristbands that keep track of your steps. Very cool to see how many calories you're burning, how many steps a day you're actually taking um, compared to what you think you're doing. Uh, and, and in those fitness apps, you can also input the food that you're eating and um, the water that you're drinking and, and all of that. So it gives you a really good gauge on how much you're actually bringing in and using. Um, so let's talk about some metabolic disorders, some diet and digestion disorders. So there are, of course, eating disorders, which are psychological problems resulting in either overeating or undereating. Anorexia nervosa is one of them. That's a self-induced starvation or lack of appetite, uh, loss of appetite. It's most common in teenage white females, generally around 30% um, percent below normal is what they weigh, and patients just simply don't see themselves as as thin as they actually are. They think that they are too fat, so to speak. Death rates can be up to 15%, very severe. Um, in this case, um, people don't die of the starvation. They're more going to pass away from complications with their organs, um, not lack of food. So very, um, ooh, skinny, skinny, skinny. Uh, bulimia is the other, uh, another eating disorder that's fairly common. This is where you have binging, eating up to 20,000 calories a day, and then inducing some vomiting or abusing laxatives to get those calories out of your body. Um, diuretics, right, flushing all of the water and substances out of your digestive tract. It's much more common than anorexia. And again, adolescent females are the general population for this. It does not mean it doesn't affect males. It does. It, and I don't have the statistics um, for this, but I bet you would be surprised how many males suffer from eating disorders compared to females. I bet it's a lot higher than you think it is. So let's talk about some health issues from bulimia. Cumulative damage to your stomach and esophagus from all the stomach acids, electrolyte imbalances, edema, swelling, cardiac arrhythmias um, with bulimia and lack of nutrients. So um, not, a, not a healthy option at all. I remember, total side note, I rarely go off topic in these lectures, by the way, but this, this video was so impactful. We watched it. And went to, I went to Baylor High School. Some of you know that. And um, you may remember Miss Hemis. She's like the health teacher there. Uh, she also coached field hockey, I believe. Um, we watched this video in her health class, and it was about this girl that threw up in jars, and she kept the jars in her closet. And I just remember thinking to myself, even at that young, selfish age of like 15, I remember thinking, I feel so bad for this girl that she has to do this to feel normal and to, oh, it's just so sad. So if you, oh, I don't know, if you know anyone or you think you know someone, if you see something, say something. Reach out to someone who you think might be suffering or might, might be having an issue. Because just because you don't have an eating disorder doesn't mean you don't have disordered eating, right? So just because you're not starving yourself or you're not um, throwing up or using laxatives doesn't mean that you don't have an eating disorder, right? You could have disordered eating or you're obsessed with food and you're constantly counting calories. You're going from diet to diet, right? Disordered eating can be just as dangerous as having an eating disorder. So um, definitely reach out to someone and try to get some help um, because it's not a not a happy way to live at all. Um, okay, sorry about my little side note there. Let's talk about obesity. Obesity is defined as being more than 20% over your ideal weight. It's linked with serious health risks, and that's why it's so important to understand your BMI. Diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesteremia, uh, or high cholesterol, right? all linked with obesity. Our um, Centers for Disease Control estimate more than a third of our population is obese. That is more than one in three people. So you have three random people in the room, at least one of them is obese. It's caused by just having too much food in your diet. Too many calories in, not enough calories out. Yes, there are links to genetics. Yes, there are things like that. However, even if you have the gene to be obese and you do not overeat, you will not be obese. Just as simple as that. It really is. 
Um, unfortunately, though, there are children who are becoming obese because of the lifestyle that their parents are leading, and therefore they're going to more than likely grow into obese adults because of the situation they're born into. So um, unfortunately, that is, that is a reality for sure. There are two major categories of obesity. You have regulatory obesity, where, where you're just not bringing in the food, right? You're, or you're bringing in, um, you're not regulating the amount of food you're bringing in, sorry. You're, you're, not, you're not stopping your eating, right? This is most common form, just indulgence, right? Metabolic obesity is very, very rare. Like I was saying, yes, there's a genetic component to obesity, but um, if you're a person with this genetic mutation or genetic condition and you have monitored your eating your whole life, you may never know that you have that genetic condition. Um, so there's still a, a, a behavioral component to even metabolic obesity. So let's talk about elevated cholesterol levels. It's associated with the development of atherosclerosis, right? Coronary artery disease, hardening of the arteries. Uh, recommended cholesterol intake is less than 300 milligrams per day. So if you have a high, high LDL levels, you're going to have all these deposits in your peripheral tissues and your blood vessels. Low HDL levels can also be a problem. We mentioned this earlier because the excess um, cholesterol is delivered to tissues um, is, is occurring through these HDLs. So if you don't have enough of them, they're just going to keep floating around in your blood. There they are, depositing on those walls of that artery. Look how narrow that artery is becoming because of those plaque deposits. Uh, you also have PKU, another metabolic disorder. This one's inherited. This disorder is actually the inability to digest and um, break down phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is an amino acid. And so infants, when they're born in a hospital setting, traditionally they are checked immediately for PKU. So if they are tested for PKU as soon as they're born, the nurses and doctors or midwives or whoever can say, you know what, this baby has PKU and the mother, if you're breastfeeding, you need to avoid phenylalanine in your diet. And if we formula feed, we need to give special formula without phenylalanine. That baby will live a completely normal life. However, if testing does not occur and then Turns out you do have a baby with PKU, but it was undetected, and you're putting peak, uh, phenylalanine into the baby. That baby can develop uh, central nervous system, uh, retardation, have brain damage, et cetera, all because you just didn't know what was happening. So it's just a quick little heel prick that they do as soon as the baby's born. They typically will do a vitamin K injection and a PKU test right away. So there's also protein deficiency disease. This is when protein synthesis is actually decreasing throughout the body. Plasma proteins, the liver, are also affected by this, reducing our osmolarity of our blood. That's going to shift the fluid around in our capillaries, allowing for edema to accumulate in the peritoneal cavity, especially, um, which is called ascites. Um, the example of this is, and I can never say it, I can never say it. This is that um, swollen belly in the little... Um, African babies that we see in like commercials, which is terrible. Um, and I hope I didn't sound like spoiled and heartless when I said that, but that's, that's what it is that, um, from protein deficiency, getting that swollen belly, this occurs in children whose protein intake is inadequate and, um, can cause brain damage as well. Oof, that's so sad. Ketoacidosis is the acidification of our blood because of the ketone bodies building up. Remember, ketone bodies are produced when there's a buildup of acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA builds up when there's lipid metabolism. When lipid metabolism is going on, or lipid catabolism, I should say, is going on through beta oxidation, you're creating lots and lots of acetyl-CoA. So there might be a backup at the citric acid cycle electron transport system. So these acetyl-CoA molecules are going to accumulate and form ketone bodies go into the blood and lower the pH of our blood. This occurs um, typically when glucose supplies are limited. So if you're doing one of those low-carb diets, actually, uh, I did a little bit of research when I taught nutrition. If you look up, and maybe you have looked up because you've done one of these before, if you ever have done a low-carb or no-carb diet, you go in and you there's actual kits that you can take to see if you're in acidosis. You can like pee on these little sticks, and it will tell you if you have uh, ketones in your urine, which would indicate ketones in your blood, which would indicate lipid metabolism going on instead of carbohydrate metabolism. 
Uh, some people are aiming for that. It can be dangerous. In extreme cases, your blood pH can drop lower than 7.05. That's like coma, cardiac arrhythmias. That's death, right? Uncontrolled diabetes can also increase your risk uh, because there's no glucose in the liver. Uh, so the liver is responding as if it's starving, catabolizing proteins and lipids instead of the glucose, which is readily available. It's just not getting into the cells because you're diabetic. Gout is another metabolic disorder. It involves the um, creation of uric acid that's mineralizing, and it typically uh, will form like a crystal around our joints, especially um, because of gravity. The, these crystals will form down in the ankle and big toe. Uh, it's known as gouty arthritis. It's very painful, consists for several days, and then eventually those crystals will dissolve back into the body. And um, very painful. I don't, oh. You can pause the video here, go back and review this section. Actually, I think I'm going to stop it here because our next section is coming up on energetics and thermoregulation. It doesn't quite relate to nutrition. So have an awesome day. Bye.